<clears throat> if Mara were alive, she'd have called me. I'm sure of that. Or, and if not me, one of the, one of her sisters. You know that she she wasn't running from her family. For nearly two decades, the Murray family has been searching for their daughter and sister after Maura crashed her car on a cold night in the woods near Haverhill, New Hampshire, and was never seen again. Maura Murray is an American woman who disappeared on the evening of February 9, 2004 after a car crash on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire, a village in the town of Haverhill. Her whereabouts remain unknown. She was a 21-year-old nursing student completing a junior year at the University of Massachusetts Amherst at the time of her disappearance. Murray's disappearance is widely regarded as the first crime mystery of the social media age. Let's take a look at her background as well as the events that led up to her disappearance. Maura Murray was born on May 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts, the fourth child of Fred and Lori Murray. She has an older brother, Fred, two older sisters, Kathleen and Julie, and a younger half-brother, Kurt. Maura was raised in an Irish Catholic household, and when she was six years old, her parents divorced, after which Maura lived primarily with her mother. Murray graduated from Whitman Hanson Regional High School, where she was a star athlete on the school's track team. She was accepted into the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, where she studied chemical engineering for three semesters. After her freshman year, she transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study nursing. In November 2003, three months prior to her disappearance, Murray admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants, including one in Hadley, Massachusetts. The charge was continued in December and was scheduled to be dismissed after three months of good behavior. On the evening of February 5th, 2004, while she was still on duty at her campus security job, Murray spoke on the phone with her older sister Kathleen. They discussed Kathleen's relationship problems with her fiancé, and around 10.30pm, while still on her shift, Murray reportedly broke down in tears, and when her supervisor arrived at her desk, Murray was, in her words, just completely zoned out, no reaction at all, and she was unresponsive. The supervisor escorted Murray back to her dorm room at around 1.20 a.m. When asked what was wrong, Murray said two words, my sister. The contents of this call remained unknown until October 2017 when Kathleen publicly explained the conversation. Kathleen, a recovering alcoholic, had been discharged from a rehabilitation clinic that evening and on the way home, her fiancé took her to a liquor store, which caused an emotional breakdown. On Saturday, February 7th, Murray's father, Fred, arrived in Amherst. He told investigators he and Murray went car shopping that afternoon and later went to dinner with a friend of his daughter. Murray dropped her father off at his motel room and borrowed his Toyota Corolla to return to campus in order to attend a dorm party. She arrived at 10.30 p.m. and at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 8th, she left the party. At 3.30 a.m. en route to her father's motel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9 in Hadley causing nearly $10,000 worth of damage to her father's car. The responding officer wrote an accident report, but there is no documentation of a field sobriety test being conducted. Murray was driven to her father's motel and stayed in his room the rest of the morning. And at 4.49 a.m., there was a cell phone call placed to her boyfriend from Fred's phone. The participants, as well as the content of the phone call, are unknown. Later that Sunday morning, Fred Murray learned that the damage to his vehicle would be covered by his auto insurance. He rented a car, dropped Murray off at the university and departed for Connecticut. At 11.30 that night, Fred called his daughter to remind her to obtain accident forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They agreed to talk again Monday night to discuss the forms and to fill out the insurance claim via phone. After midnight on Monday, February 9th, Murray used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. The first reported contact Murray had with anyone on February 9th was at 1 p.m. when she emailed her boyfriend. I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking too much to anyone. I promised to call today, though. Love you, Maura. She also made a phone call inquiring about renting a condominium at the same Bartlett, New Hampshire condo association with which her family had vacationed in the past. 
Telephone records indicate that the call lasted three minutes and the owner did not rent the condo to Murray. And at 1.13 p.m., Murray called a fellow nursing student for reasons unknown. On the afternoon of Monday, February 9th at 1.24 p.m., Murray emailed a work supervisor of the nursing school faculty stating that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in her family. But according to her family, there was no death. At 2.05 p.m., Murray called the number which provided recorded information about booking hotels in Vermont. The call lasted approximately five minutes and at 2.18 p.m., she telephoned her boyfriend and left a voice message promising him that they would talk later. This call ended after only one minute. In her car, Murray packed clothing, toiletries, college textbooks and birth control pills. When her room was searched later, campus police discovered that most of her belongings had been packed in boxes and that the art had been removed from her walls. It is not clear whether Murray packed them that day, but police at the time said she had packed between Sunday night and Monday morning. On top of the boxes was a printed email to Murray's boyfriend indicating trouble in their relationship. And at around 3.30 p.m., Murray drove off campus in her black 1996 satin sedan. At 3.40 p.m., Murray withdrew $280 from an ATM and CCTV footage showed that she was alone. She then proceeded to go to a nearby liquor store where she purchased about $40 worth of alcoholic beverages including Bailey's Irish Cream, Kahlua, Vodka, as well as a box of Franzia wine. Security footage again showed that she was alone when she made these purchases. Murray then left Amherst between 4 and 5 p.m., presumably via Interstate 91 North. She called to check her cell phone at 4.37 p.m., and this would be the last recorded use of her cell phone. To date, there is no indication that she informed anyone of her destination, or even any evidence that she had chosen one. Sometime after 7 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump outside her house, and through her window, she could see a car up against a snowbank along Route 112. And at 7.27 p.m., she telephoned the Grafton County Sheriff's Department to report the accident. And according to the 911 log, the woman claimed to have seen a man smoking a cigarette inside the car. However, she later stated that she had not seen a man nor a person smoking a cigarette, but rather had seen what appeared to be a red light glowing from inside the car, potentially from a cell phone. A school bus driver who lived nearby stopped at the scene when he saw the car as well as a young woman walking around the vehicle. I couldn't see any blood on her face and she was uh, shaking like this. I says, uh, okay, I'm gonna go call the police. One police report actually stated that she pleaded for him not to call the police. She also assured him that she had already called AAA. However, AAA has no record of any such call. Knowing there was no cellular reception in the area, the bus driver continued home and called the police. His call was received by the sheriff's department at 7.43 p.m. and he was unable to see Murray's car while he made the call but did notice several cars pass on the road before the police arrived. Another local resident driving home from work claims she passed by the scene around 7.37 p.m. and saw a police SUV parked face to face with Murray's car. She pulled over briefly and did not see anyone inside or outside the cars and decided to continue home. However, this witness's statement contradicts official police logs which shows Haver Hill police arriving nine minutes later. According to the official police log, at 7.46 p.m. a Haver Hill police officer arrived at the scene but the woman driver had disappeared. No one was inside or around the car. The car had impacted the tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and pushing the car's radiator into the fan, rendering it inoperable. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had deployed and the car was locked. Inside the car, the officer found an empty beer bottle as well as a damaged box of Frontier wine on the rear seat. In addition, he also found a AAA card issued to Murray blank accent report forms, gloves, compact discs, makeup, diamond jewelry, as well as driving directions to Burlington, Vermont. 
Missing were Murray's debit and credit cards as well as her cell phone, none of which had been located or used since her disappearance. The police also later reported that some of the bottles of purchased liquor were also missing. Police traced the vehicle to Murray and initially treated her as a missing person on the belief that she may have wanted to disappear voluntarily. This speculation was based on her travel preparations about which she had confided nothing to friends or family and there was no obvious evidence of foul play. Everything that was found in a car was indicative of her just trying to get away and clear her head, although I can't be for sure because I don't know why she went up there. Strangely enough, a rag believed to have been part of Murray's emergency roadside kit was found stuffed into the muffler pipe of Murray's car. The first responding officer did notice some peculiar things at the scene where the Saturn was found, such as a rag in the tailpipe. There was some red liquid, which may have indicated that she was drinking. And in 2009, Murray's case was handed over to the New Hampshire Cold Case Division, and authorities are handling it as a suspicious missing person case. At 12.36 p.m. the following day on February 10th, a Be On The Lookout report for Murray was issued. She was reported as wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a black backpack. A voicemail was also left on Fred Murray's home answering machine at 3.20 p.m. stating that her car had been found abandoned, but he was working out of state at the time and did not receive this call. At 5 p.m., Murray's older sister contacted her father to tell him of the situation, and he then contacted the Heavy Hill Police Department and was told that if Murray was not reported safe by the following morning, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department would start a search. On February 11th, Murray's father arrived before dawn in Haver Hill, and at 8 a.m., New Hampshire Fish and Game, the Murrays, as well as others, began to search. A police dog tracked the scent from one of Murray's gloves 100 yards east from where the vehicle had been discovered, but lost the scent. This suggested to police that she'd left the area in another car. Although missing person cases are normally handled by local and state police, the FBI joined the investigation 10 days after she disappeared. Around this time, New Hampshire Fish and Game also conducted a second ground and air search using a helicopter with a thermal imaging camera, as well as tracking dogs and cadaver dogs. The March 2004 disappearance of Brianna Maitland in Montgomery, Vermont, 66 miles away from Murray's last sighting in Woodsville, drew comparisons from media and law enforcement due to the similarities in the disappearances. However, state police have stated that there are no links between the two cases. And in a press release, they stated they believed that Mora was headed for an unknown destination and may have accepted a ride in order to continue to that location, adding that they discovered no evidence that a crime had been committed. Several times a year, um, we'll investigate cases where people came to the mountains for the purposes of, of getting away from whatever their problems may have been and sometimes with the intention of harming themselves. The New Hampshire League of Investigators, consisting of 10 retired police officers and detectives, as well as the Molly Bish Foundation, started working on the case in 2006. This is something beyond a mere missing persons case. Something ominous could have happened here. Also in October of 2006, volunteers led a two-day search within miles of where Murray's car was found. And it was this search that led them to the closet inside of an A-frame house approximately one mile from the crash site, where cadaver dogs apparently went bonkers, possibly identifying the presence of human remains. And a sample of carpet from the home was sent to the New Hampshire State Police, but the results were never released to the public. Fifteen years after a young woman disappeared, her father now believes her remains are buried in the basement of a New Hampshire home. There's a human body, a dead body, a dead person there. The odds are, I think, that it's my daughter, but it's somebody's. Later on, an excavation would be done from within the basement of the house, and nothing was found except for what appeared to be a piece of old pottery or old piping. On September 14th, 2021, New Hampshire State Police announced that bone fragments had been found on Loon Mountain in Lincoln, New Hampshire, approximately 25 miles east of the site of Murray's crash. 
However, in November, it was announced that the remains were not from Murray. In January of 2022, the FBI issued a national alert in Murray's case and created a violent criminal apprehension profile, allowing multiple law enforcement agencies to share information regarding her case. Maura's disappearance has been the subject of numerous documentaries, including a non-fiction book titled True Crime Addict, How I Lost Myself in the Mysterious Disappearance of Maura Murray by author and journalist James Renner. In the book, Renner proposed the theory that Murray traveled into New Hampshire with a tandem driver and may have disappeared willingly and started a new life elsewhere due to the fears that her pending credit card fraud case would prevent her from being hired as a nurse. He also proposed another, less likely theory that she was murdered by someone she knew. Fred Murray has however stated that he believes that his daughter was abducted and that she is dead. If Mara were alive, she'd have called me. I'm sure of that. Or, and if not me, one of, the, one of her sisters. You know, that she, she wasn't running from her family. 